We are here because we have our friend Randy Polka here, and Randy has a Bachelor of Science, a Master of Science, and a PhD studying soil. So he's a research soil scientist with the USDA Forest Services Northern Research Station, which is in Grand Rapids. He is an adjunct professor at six different universities, and he has published 275 and counting articles. So we are so lucky to be able to learn from Randy here today. Welcome, Randy. Great to be here again. Uh, we talked about spruce about two years ago. And uh, one of the things I've been working on ever since I was a graduate student is also mercury. And so we got to talking about mercury on a spruce field trip we had not too long ago with some of the climate change group. And Barb said, well, why don't we talk about mercury? And uh, contacted Lacey and we got to the Tuesday group. And here I am for my second trip to you guys. Fantastic. I just didn't expect it to be so hot in the this time. <laughs> I'll just give you a little bit of background on sort of forest service research before we get going here. Um, this is our footprint of our research station. And you can see right here, here's, my, here's where I'm located in Grand Rapids. Uh, Marcel Experimental Forest, which is where about half of the talk will be centered about, is on the Marcel Experimental Forest. Then about half of it will be up here in the Superior National Forest in the Boundary Lines. Um, our footprint goes all the way to the northeast and our location of our central offices here in Madison, Wisconsin. At the Marcel Experimental Forest, we've been doing stuff for 60 years. Um, really neat long-term place. Started about 1960. And one of the things we do research on at Marcel, and one of the reasons it's where it's at in the landscape and part of our experimental forest network are the peatlands that exist at Marcel, these carbon-rich ecosystems that have tons and tons of carbon, wetlands, and are really important from a climate change perspective, and hence why the spruce experiment was put at Marcel and on peatlands. And so peatlands are a central focus of this talk as well. They're really important sources of mercury, unfortunately, too. Um, but at first, we didn't even know anything about these peatlands. We just looked at their ecology, their soils, and hydrology. Spent some work in Scandinavia and Russia on peatlands, but not much. A little in Canada. And then we did all kinds of forest management effects of the watersheds at Marcel. And that's what the experimental forests are all about with us. We have control watersheds. And then we do something in other watersheds, manipulation. And we might harvest the upland. We might harvest the peatland. We might burn the upland. We might burn the... We, we grazed cows and uplands. We did all kinds of crazy stuff over the 60 years we've done that. So look at the effects of basically forest management on wetland ecosystems. Yep. And, and you hold it after you? Just hold it. Hold it yeah. Any better? All right. Now I feel like the meeting. But I got to stay next to this one too. So. Yeah. And so again, um, about the 1970s, we started seeing acid rain and the acid rain days hit. So we started looking at biogeochemical cycling, especially sulfate, and nitrate. Early 1990s, late 80s, we were starting to think about mercury bioaccumulation in our food chains. Uh, we had methodologies at that point where we could detect mercury in our fish and we could tell that it was hazardous to our health. And about that same time, we started looking at our climate records and we started seeing climate change happening. So, and in the 60 or so years, we went up about two and a half degrees Fahrenheit at Marcel over that 60 years. So, our growing season at Marcel is probably even more extended here, is about three weeks longer than it was in 1960. For Mercury. Um, number of different things we're going to touch on today. None of them with any depth, but uh, sort of glossing over a bunch of different topics. Talk about the species and the health effects, the cycling of mercury in the watershed, importance of snow melt, sulfate's a big one. We'll talk about why sulfate's important. 
methyl mercury production. Methyl mercury is the one that bioaccumulates in the food chain. That's the one we don't want to have in our ecosystems. And where that occurs, where that methylation occurs in the landscape, some of the late chemistry controls on bioaccumulation in fish, and we both mentioned spruce, because you do have some mercury studies there on effects of warming. And then we'll finish up with some fire research that we've been doing. So there's lots of different mercury species, but bottom line for today, is I'll just talk about two, and that is total mercury, which is all the mercury, okay? It's all the species combined, simple. And then there's the methyl particle mercury, and that's the one that bioaccumulates in the food chain. So it's those two species, methyl mercury and total mercury we'll talk about today, okay? You will see it. Which we go through today as well. And so, where does methylation occur? Where is the, where is the bad mercury produced? It's produced in a couple of different places in our landscapes. It's, it's produced where we have very low oxygen, so inundated conditions, uh, waterlogged type conditions where we don't have very high oxygen. Uh, we got to have some food for the bugs, the microbes, right? And they need carbon, so they like, they like carbon. And the final piece of that puzzle is sulfate. And it, it ion that's the electron acceptor for the mercury methylation to occur. And so we're finding out that it's not just sulfate these days, but it also could be iron. It also could be manganese and other metals as well. So kind of bad news for the mining part of the world, actually. And so where do those circumstances occur? Well, they occur in wetlands, right? Peatlands, uh, what we'll talk about today, and then the bottoms of lakes and rivers. So that, that's where the bad mercury is being produced, the bioaccumulative for methyl mercury. If you look at, at a watershed basis and the number of wetlands in the area, it goes through the roof as you get more and more wetlands. So the more wetlands you have, the more methyl mercury that your watershed is gonna produce. So we should probably just drain all of our wetlands and just take care of them and call it a day, right? For the mercury. <laughs> Obviously, wetlands have a lot of other great virtues that we don't want to drain them for. Okay. And for mercury, it's a bioaccumulation that is the problem. And so the burden of the mercury of things at the bottom of the food chain, the whole burden goes up to the next level of the food chain, and then the next level, next level, next level. And what food chains have the most in their, most levels in them, I guess, most trophic levels, and that's the aquatic system, okay? And so it's really an aquatic problem uh, related to mercury. And so the fish, the minnows take up the cestin and take up and fish pick it up and they go into the loons and the walleyes and the people and the otters, eagles, and whatnot. And the higher up you get in this food chain, the higher the concentration is in our bodies. Okay. There was a study in the northeastern US a while back now, probably 15 years, where they were finding mercury that was sky high in the inland forest birds in New York. And um they said, well, where is this mercury coming from? It's not a, they're not a, they're not an aquatic bird. They're just a upland tweedy type bird. And what they found is the diet of these birds were mainly spiders. And if you look at a spider's web, what do they catch? They catch mosquito larvae, dragonflies, all aquatic derived critters. So it does go back to the aquatic system anyway. And so generally it's an aquatic problem, it's not a terrestrial problem. Unless you have some mining situations like we do on the range up here. And so it can be bad, really bad. Matter of fact, if you get too much of it. Um, it has a lot of different effects on our bodies, um, neural being one of them. And there's been a number of different poisonings over, over the years. Um, the Alice in Wonderland person that Hands the hats, the Mad Hatter guy, he was mad because of the mercurial chloride that they used to use to tan hats. And so the Mad Hatter was mad because of mercury. And uh, that's the way they used to tan hats back in the days was with this mercury compound. 
Then there's a couple of major poisonings, one in Minimata Bay, Pan. And in that case, there was an industrial factory there that made, if you think about the Polaroid pictures they used to use back in the 70s and 80s, there was that silvery back on, on those pictures. Do you remember that at all? That wasn't silver, it was mercury, okay? And this plant in Japan produced that material, one of the Polaroid pictures. And then they just dumped the effluent into this mini amount of bay. And now we're at 60 years plus since that occurred, and they're still having huge effects in the amount of bay with you know levels of child loss and mental retardation and all kinds of things 60 years later. It's it's, it's permeated into that group of people at this point and the, the genetics. The other big one is the Iraq poisoning, which happened in the 40s in Syria. They used to use a mercury compound to um, preserve seed when it went to the field. It, it's a fungicide, so the seed doesn't rot. Well, a truck that was going to go to the field and be planted got, um, unfortunately, went to the plant where they made flour, got confused with the truck that was supposed to go to the plant to make flour, and they made flour out of a truck full of this contaminated mercury seed. And about 3,000 people died in Syria. And so those are some of the first couple of indicators of just how bad this pollutant can be, these massive sort of events. And that's when we really started thinking about mercury. And so the most susceptible groups are babies being born and, and women of childbearing age for those babies that are being born. The bioaccumulating the food chain, just like anywhere else, and the babies get the bulk of, the, of what we got in our bodies as well. And so what demographics are those that eat a lot of fish? Um, those are the ones that are the most susceptible, not surprising. And we talked mm -hmm. briefly about the other group about the North Shore. There's a, definitely been some studies on the North Shore that shows that kids and babies born on the North Shore, in some cases, are pretty high sky high and mercury, way above what they eat. So it's, a, it's right here at home as well. If you look at our guidance for fish consumption, they're in every U.S. state, every Canadian province, and across Europe, and every surface water body in Minnesota. Minnesota Department of Health has programs in which they go back and they resample lakes over time, and they measure mercury in fish, a uh, variety of types of fish um, across the board they measure. And uh, yeah, maybe it's better if I can put it up here. Just put it up higher. We'll try this for a little bit, see if this is any better. <coughs> me. And so the Minnesota Department of Health goes back, I think every five years, and measures mercury in some fish in some lakes that are the tourist lakes, the ones that get the most fishing and the most money making lakes in the state, so they can have lake specific consumption guidelines for mercury in the fish. Most of the lakes in Minnesota don't have that level of sampling. So they have a general guideline as well for those lakes that don't get sampled that frequently. And the general guidelines for Minnesota is if you're in that susceptible group, you can maybe have a weekly um, meal of crappie or perch or some fish. So panfish basically weekly is okay. Monthly, if you're getting some of the bigger fish, like northern pike or walleye. And I don't know why you eat a muskie, but don't ever eat a muskie. Mm -hmm. um, the non susceptible group, um, it's a lot less. You need four servings a week for the panfish and maybe uh, once a week for walleyes. However, some of the lakes have lake specific guidelines, like I just mentioned, and they've been sampled over time. And I always find a lake nearby to where I'm giving this talk. And I don't know if I've ever found a lake as polluted as white iron before. Nah, mm -hmm. mercury consumption guidelines. And so I was asking some of the earlier group, and there must have been some minor impacts in white iron water at some point because it's sky high compared to the most As far as consumption, but um, burnt side's not great either, to be honest. Uh, but I picked white iron. And so for white iron, um, 
that susceptible group again, maybe have one meal a month of panfish or pike or walleye and never eat pike over 33 inches or a walleye greater than 23 inches for that susceptible group. You don't eat them. Don't eat a walleye, don't eat a big walleye out of those lakes if you're in that susceptible group. Good part of the general population, a meal a week is okay. So if it's less than 26 inches for a northern pike, if it gets bigger than 26 inches again, that'll be one meal a month. And the size classes are in there, whoops, because the bigger the fish get, the more mercury it's got in, right? Makes sense, because it's bioaccumulating. accumulating, the bigger the fish gets, the more it eats, the more mercury is burden the fish gets. That's why there's a, a length definition. So where is it coming from? Um, really three main sources, burning of fossil fuels, the big one, coal especially, uh, gold mining, especially some of the artisanal mining that's occurring in South America is another huge source that is increasing in source over time. It used to be next to nothing, but they have found a lot of gold in some of the river tributaries of the Amazon River. And they just go in and they destroy those areas and to get the gold out of the sediment of those rivers, they use mercury because mercury and gold have a high affinity for one another and pulls the gold right out as part of their process. And then, of course, they just leave the mercury there and then move on to the next spot down river, get the whole thing to serve. And then uh, the other one is mining and smelting. So that comes into play here as well, obviously. And where is it all coming from? Um, a lot of it's coming from the newly industrialized part of the world, not surprisingly. Places that don't have things like the Clean Air and Clean Water Act within their jurisdiction. Um, and so Asia is a big one. China is a big one, obviously. And so this is a ways back now, obviously 2006, but I was in Beijing for a conference. And you think this is maybe like sundown or sunset, but if you look in the sky, it's about 10.30 in the morning. And that's what my window looked like out my hotel. Now in Beijing, you kind of telling the other group, they shut down all the coal fire power plants and whatnot in that part of the world for about uh, six months, three to six months right before the 2008 Olympics. And had the bluebird skies for Beijing Olympics. And of course, as soon as the Olympics were over, they turned it back on again. It was like this. Um, so, kind of interesting. They can, they do shut them down. And there's actually a guy at our last meeting that said that uh, the Chinese health index went way up during the Olympics. It's not surprising. All right. So now that's sort of the background. Any questions about the background of mercury? We're going to get into some of the research. Yeah. Where can you find this information by, by lake? You mentioned Burnside and White Island. Where can you find the information? Minnesota Lake Finder. There is a um, spot on there that says it has lake specific information if it has it. Mercury. On mercury or PCBs or PFAS or whatever. Lake Finder. Yeah. How much fish would you have to eat to have like noticeable effects? Um, if you're in that susceptible group or you're a, you're a fetus and an unborn fetus or whatever, not much. Um, you know, if, if you're an unborn fetus in your mom's belly and she's eating more than a meal or two a week, it's probably going to affect you. And you're going to, there's, there's chances, and then, then there's chances of whatever you know, thing might happen as a result of it. Um, in some cases, you might get a lot of mercury in your system. You might turn out okay. Some systems, you might only get relatively minimal amount of mercury, and it depends how your body works. It might be bad. So you can't really put a number on it. Put it down. Really, the sign. For for babies, it's 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 mental things. It's not being able to read. You know, at the time frame that they, they should be reading. Sometimes it is mobility as well. They're not as mobile as some of the other kids that aren't affected by mercury. And so there's a variety of things that doctors look for when they think about mercury poisoning of uh, of yeah. so all those things, all those health effects are magnified for those 
bad situation. What about like an adult? Full grown helping out, especially that. I gotta believe a lot of it would be in your mind. It could start affecting your, your mind processing, forgetfulness, um, age to when you know you would have, start to have some mental breakdowns. I would guess would be part of that. Although I don't know all the medical history of the effects of mercury. To be honest with you, so I'm I'm guessing in a lot of cases outside outside of my sort of wheelhouse. Any other questions? All right, let's talk about some research. And so if you look at a watershed, water is full, forested water, that is, come from the atmosphere, they go through the canopy, they come through it in the form of through fall, which is the water that comes through the canopy. They hit the upland soil and the peatlands, and some of it might percolate down into the subsoil and even the groundwater. Other stuff runs off to the peatland. The peatlands, in this case, a bog, it's interesting because bogs are domed in the middle, so the runoff runs from the center of the bog to the edge. So they run from the center of the bog to the edge, and of course the upland runoff runs to that edge too, and this edge around the peatland is called the leg zone, that will become important in a little bit. So the very two different waters meeting these watersheds. Upland waters are nutrient rich, aerated, lots of carbon that's really edible, and lots of other things, nitrogen, nutrients. Peatland waters are all just the opposite. Low pH, low nutrients, no oxygen. And so you need in this lag zone, it becomes a biogeochemical soup, and it has some implications for mercury. If you look at the checkbook balance for a watershed, approximately 34%. Um, of what goes into the watershed stays in the watershed every day. So about two thirds goes out the end of the watershed, downstream to the lakes and rivers, but about a third of it every year stays in the watershed. So think about a third of that mercury every year staying in your watershed for the last 50 years since the industrial revolution. A lot of mercury in our watershed built up right now, right? So even if we decrease emissions a lot, we're still going to have mercury leaking out of our watersheds for a long, long time. And if you just look at the single event of snow melt, somewhere between a quarter and a third, almost 40% of the mercury comes out in that one event every spring. And if you look at separating the upland waters from the peatland waters, most of the methyl mercury that comes out of those watersheds is from the peatland waters. Somewhere around 80 to 90 percent of the methyl mercury comes from the peatland component of the runoff, not the upland component of the runoff. Get what I'm saying? And so, if you separate those two waters, the peatland water is what's really contributing to the methyl mercury, the bioaccumulative form downstream. We'll look at sulfate a little more carefully here. The thought is, if you add sulfate to a sulfate star system. You get mercury, methyl mercury being produced. That means that sulfate is uh, the sulfate reducer is the bug that's probably not in the mercury as well, the micro. And so we did that by putting in a sprinkler system in one of our bugs at Marcel. And here you can see the sprinklers running. <laughs> we measured mercury in peatland floor water and all that. We measured mercury wherever we could find a water source. And if you look at the outlet, so the water coming out of the watershed to go downstream, about twice as much methyl mercury came out of the watershed as prior to the sulfate deposition experiment. Okay. And so it definitely is the sulfate reducing microbes that are methylating the mercury. Now it turns out, like I said, they're just one of the one of the bugs that are doing it. We're finding out there's a lot more other ones. And then in that same experiment, we turned off some of the sprinklers and we had a zonation in it where we had the control that never received any deposition. We had the experimental side that was continued to see, receive that deposition four times our annual amount. Then we had this zone where we turned off the sulfate deposition for a few years and looked at the mosquito larvae as an indicator of our 
of our mercury situation. And as you can see, the mosquito larvae went down pretty quick after two years of it not having sulfate being deposited on it, but it still is higher than the control. And so, good sign, but and so but not in two years, but maybe in five years, the water should be back to normal after all that sulfate we dumped in. That's, that's a pretty good sign, actually. We also looked at the factors that control the methylation of mercury, and this is a fancy word for these wooden boxes. They're called mesocosms. So these are mesocosms in, in science terms, not wooden boxes. <laughs> uh, so we put out these mesocosms out in one of the open bogs at Martell, and we put in different levels of sulfate and organic uh, food for the microbes. For the food, we put in really edible sugars. Just sugar, just like sugar from your shelf, glucose, one of them, lactate, other ones are also different kinds of sugar acetate. And then we also steep some litter from conifer trees and deciduous trees, and we added that litter water to these things as well. And we did not see anything. You look at these are all the different types of carbon sources, and these are the days after we put it in. Nothing, no response. So the bugs aren't carbon limited. They're in a peatland. It's all carbon all around them. That's not what they're, they're not limited by carbon. Oh, yeah. If you add sulfate, then, they're, then they start spewing out mercury, methyl mercury. Okay. So they are sulfur limited. They are sulfate limited. And so if you add four times more sulfate than normal or 10 times more sulfate than normal, you start seeing these responses, okay? And I don't know how much mercury is in this alligator garbage. There's got to be a lot of it. <laughs> <Then you know. laughs> I kissed it and threw it back. And then I have one more part to that puzzle. All right. So it's not carbon limited, it's sulfate limited. If we add sulfate, we get a response. And then we give, if we get them, give the bug sulfate, then they become carbon limited. And so we give them more carbon. And it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And once they become salt, once they are happy with the amount of sulfur they got, then they want more carbon. Once they have the amount of carbon they want, then they want more sulfate. It continues up the chain. And so about twice as much if you add the carbon and the sulfate together than with the sulfate alone. We also kind of look in the landscape on where methyl mercury is, a ha is happening the most within a watershed. And we did that by looking at where the percentage of the methyl was the highest percentage of all the mercury, the total mercury. Okay? And we've made that 22% based on some 90th interval. We saw above that, that's where the hot spots are happening for methylation. That's where the, the, the methyl mercury is the biggest part of the total mercury. And if you look at the outline of water of the peatlands at Marcel, down here, is the outside of the peatland. So this is the margin of the peatland right here. And these are some similar peatlands up in Canada at a place called the Experimental Lakes area. You can see that all the big black dots where mercury, methyl mercury is the highest is where? It's on the edge. They're in that margin. And what did I call that margin before? We call it that lag zone, remember? That's where, all the methyl, that's where bulk of the methyl mercury is actually occurring in these watersheds. It's happening in that little zone that's usually even narrower than the length of this room. And that's the zone where the methyl mercury is really the source is. So it's a fairly small zone. It's better to stay out of it and not mess around with too much. All right. Now we're switching gears a little bit to this part of the world. Boundary waters and not like Marcel isn't part of this world, but not too far away. Um, we started looking at fish, mercury, and boundary waters, and fire, and some other aspects of all the recycling. Now, if you just look at lakes that are, we're not talking about burning at this point. We, we looked at Thelma and Everett, Bell, this and dislocation, and Ella and Mud. We looked at a whole bunch of different lakes. And basically, what controlled the mercury concentration in the fish. And what we used as a fish indicator was little tiny young perch. They bioaccumulate the best 
for the situation from the latest time period next to when they were born. So it's a, kind of a snapshot in time, which you use young fish. Um, total phosphorus and suspended solids are big predictors of mercury in the fish in those watersheds. And so keeping erosion and all that stuff out of the lakes, just like you'd want to do for all other practices, is a good thing for mercury too. One of the things we also found in that study, though, is uh, lakes with nitrogen had lower mercury concentrations. And we think that's because nitrogen is a, you know, is a pretty important component on the productivity of fish populations. So the more nitrogen you got, the more higher the productivity of fish are. And they grow bigger per unit time with lots of nitrogen than less nitrogen. And that dilutes the mercury pool in those systems. And so lots of nitrogen, less mercury per unit fish, lots of sediment and phosphorus, more nutrients per, per unit fish. Either way, keep that outside stuff out of the lakes. That's, that's the best problem. Now we'll talk basically quickly about spruce. If you don't know about spruce, it's the biggest climate change experiment on the planet. It's uh, incredible. You should read about it. I won't, won't get into it today. That's why I actually talked to this group about it. The first time when I was here a couple of years ago. So it's a warming, soil, air warming, elevated CO2 experiment looking at the functions of climate change on peatland ecosystems. And here's a fair photo of spruce. And these are our enclosures or chambers. And they're both above ground and below ground. Here's a below ground corral. So they're individual little tiny watersheds. And uh, they have temperatures that range from ambient to up to nine degrees centigrade so 16 degrees fahrenheit so i think yesterday i saw the record in rapids was 97. so in the warmest chamber this is one of the warmest chambers right here for example it would have been 113 in that chamber a plus 16 so it's always a differential from outside and so we it would have been unbelievable in that chamber yesterday and today And warming does have an effect on mercury. We talked about total and methyl, but there's also gaseous mercury, and that's what comes out of the soil when it's volatilized, it's evaded. And uh, warming definitely appears to increase the gaseous mercury coming out of these ecosystems. Doesn't mean a lot, really. It just means that that mercury is being taken out of the ecosystem and transported somewhere downwind and deposited someplace else, probably. And also, the amount of mercury in the pore water is increasing relative to the soil. So you got this balance between the amount of mercury in the soil and the amount of mercury in the water surrounding the soil, and that balance is changing. More of that soil mercury is becoming water mercury. And what's the closer connection to the water body downstream? The water mercury, right? And so if you get more mercury in the water part of the peatland, that's going to lead to more mercury transported downstream. Not, not as good, not, not as much as if it was stated in the soil. And then the Pagami fire. Um, yeah, it, it was a crazy fire. It definitely led to a whole bunch of new discoveries as far as mercury and, and fire. And we got involved very early on with the Pagami fire. You just look at the amount of mercury that was lost in the uplands of the Pagami, not even the peatlands. I couldn't figure out how to do the peatlands at the time, but I do now. And we're applying what I know now to the Greenwood fire in 2021. As we speak. But back then, I, we just did the uplands. And uh, one year the, of the Pagami fire, about 20% of that amount that came out of Pagami of the 2019 total emissions from mercury in the state. And that's all sectors of the state. That's you know, coal combustion, the whole nine yards. So 20%, that's a pretty significant fraction in just that one fire. This is that one year, but still significant. You can expect those contributions, those annual ones, probably increase in the future. And if you look at the deposition of mercury, both pre and post fire, so we're looking at pre fire here, and this is the total, and this is the methyl. First time we go collect after fire, boom, we got tons of mercury as we fire locally deposited. Then it goes down over time. Again, if you look at that amount of deposition, 
That's about 30 to 40 percent of the whole deposition of the year, just as a result of that one fire. So again, these fire events are pretty major in their occurrences on those particular years. If we had years where we have lots of fires, it could overtake other sectors of work. Question is, can we pick that up in the food chain? We look at what was burned as a result of the fire. We see that the soils themselves were not burnt hardly at all. Good. The main thing that was burnt is the forest floor or the duct layer that's on top of the soil. That's what went back up to the atmosphere. And so, and there was a lot there, obviously, but based on how severe the fire was, you will be in no fire and D being very severe, you can see the content of the mercury goes straight down. So the more severe fire, the more mercury that goes up in the atmosphere from the litter layer. You don't see that in the upper soils upper and a little bit lower. And other studies have found that as well. If you look long term, and this is from a colleague of mine, um, and you look at fires like recently, and you look at fires areas that are 250 years since fire, you can see the litter in that upper layer, the O and the A rise, and just goes up, up, up with time. So accumulating deposition over time. So when it burns, it's like, cleans it for a while. It's like it's no mercury in that watershed for a little bit. So we always thought the hypothesis I always had was you'd get this little blip of mercury in the fish after fire, and then the actual concentration of mercury in fish would go down over time until that litter layer started to accumulate again. Still trying to find that result, but that's my still have my hypothesis. And so if you look at areas that were burned, in this case, it was burned twice. The uh, Everett Lake, it was burned in 2004 and 2007, but it wasn't never severely burned. It was more of a slight to moderate burn both of the fires. And you look at that concentration, you compare it to um, Thelma, which was not burned, we don't see any differences. So the good news is, these slight to moderate fires don't increase mercury and fish in the boundary waters. So that's good. We still don't know. Whoops. We still don't know the answer to what happens in severely burned watersheds. And I still don't know that, unfortunately, for you. So after fire, some things you should consider. Again, mitigate any erosion that's occurring. Anything where carbon is moving, litter, whatever, try to keep that out of the water. Anything in the sediment. Again, good news, at least moderate fires, we don't have a mercury issue with the uh, accumulation in fish. Again, we still don't know the effects of, uh, of the severe fire though. And so just sort of, this is all summarizing at this point, we're doing pretty good. So they mentioned the canopy is a source of mercury because that's what's coming down from atmospheric deposition. Soils are sinks, about 34% of what comes in every year stays there. Snow melts a big period of time when that mercury is transported out of our watersheds. And until we find alternative energy sources, of course, um, it's gonna be an important issue. And so we consider to think about that. And this young lady just turned 38 last week. <laughs> Not quite there yet. <laughs> um, thankfully, the nasty culprit sulfate is going down big time as far as emissions. And uh, that's again because of our Clean Air Acts and other things that have occurred from the EPA over time. And we are cleaning enough sulfate out of our system. That's from an atmospheric deposition point. It's not necessarily from other points of view. Okay. So even though it's decreasing, we got to be aware of what we're doing out there with sulfate. As far as methyl mercury production, it doesn't feel like the microbes are carbon limited, but when you give them sulfate, then they become carbon limited. You give them more carbon, they go crazy and they like it even better, right? And the leg, leg zone, that 
zone in between the uplands and the peatland is really where the bulk of this methylation occurs in the watersheds, as well as the bottoms of lakes and things like I mentioned earlier. As non-fire related things, dissolved pea and suspended solids lead to higher concentrations, but nitrogen leads to lower because it's possibly a growth dilution. And we have increases in total methylmercury in poor waters with warming in spruce. Not a good sign. That means it's probably getting but warming is going to probably lead to more ported mercury downstream, higher accumulations in our fish. Again, and some of the more recent results suggest even, even more directly that. We certainly have more deposition following fire. There's more mercury that comes down our landscapes. Um, and there's large decreases in the mercury in that upper forest floor layer, but not so much the soils. We did not see effect low to moderate fire severity on mercury accumulation in the lakes. That's a win. Um, again, we still don't know the more severe fire aspect. So I will end at that point and show you uh, my favorite place is it's not too far from here. Uh, anyone know what lake that might be just from the profile? A little bit to the east of us. Lake Isabella. That's we, one of the places we go every year. Actually, we're in the back. No, we were just talking about that though. Um, did, did we look at Birch Lake? And uh, we were just talking about it. it. Sounds like Birch Lake is a tributary to White Iron or has some influence on White Iron. Is that right? Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know anything really about Birch Lake. Sounds like an interesting place. So, and, yeah. Just wondering if you have to. And you're not a nuclear chemist or anything, but if you have an opinion on Fukushima, they're just running out of storage for new, for radioactive water, and so they're starting to put it in the ocean, and they intend to do so for decades. Now, obviously, that can't be positive, but is it? Do you have any idea if it's how negative it could be? No. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little outside of my. I, I'm aware of it, but I don't think I can give you a, a good answer. Yeah, Randy, do you expect any increase in mercury from the Canadian fires uh, to our landscape? Yeah, there's probably been more deposition. Not probably. There has been more deposition, I'm sure. And I think the more time that we get fire smoke in our part of the world, I think we're going to continue to see higher deposition over time. Again, does that find itself in the food chain? Is it bioaccumulating fish? And you can actually detect that and affect our fish consumption advisories. I don't know the answer to that one. Very, but yeah, wherever there's smoke, there's mercury, not fire. Wherever there's smoke, there's mercury being bothered. So my question is, um, can you absorb the mercury through just drinking water? And if you can, is no, it, it, it's part of our, it really attaches to our fat tissue and particularly lipids is what it attaches to. So you can't flush your system of it readily at all, unfortunately. Well, maybe. Um, I don't think I drink white iron lake water, for example. Well, well water is just fine though. If, if, your, if your water is relatively colorless, it's probably okay, but don't quote me on that. I'll come back and sue the Forest Service. But um, if you have a little color in your water, that's probably going to be an indicator. It's also some pretty high level of mercury in the water. Is that something the city? Treats out of the water. They do. Mercury. They do. They treat mercury and they, and they treat color and then they, they dissolve their organic carbon, which makes that color the yellowish, or orange, or blackish colors. Um, they also try in some, in many districts, I know in Duluth, for example, they try to get that carbon out of the water as well. 
which takes a significant fraction of mercury. Randy, uh, could you uh, summarize the results from the spruce experiment? Uh, when you have higher temperatures and CO2, what happens to heat as a source and think of carbon? Yeah, and so that's what spruce was put on the planet for, really, is to look at the carbon balance of peelings under climate change. We're doing all kinds of neat other stuff, including mercury and all, all, lots of other crazy studies. But uh, by and large, even a moderate increase in temperature flips these ecosystems from being carbon sinks to being carbon sources to the atmosphere. So these peatlands have been in our landscape since the last glaciation, which is about 11,000 ish years ago. Probably a little younger up here in the Grand Rapids, probably not much. <laughs> And they've been accumulating that carbon, and sometimes it's going to be tens of feet of carbon, so two or three times the height of the ceiling over that time period. And so not only are they not sources of carbon in the atmosphere, they're actually mitigating carbon in the atmosphere. They're taking carbon, CO2 and methane and other carbon sources out of our atmosphere and helping with our climate change issue. All of a sudden, we're pushing them with warming, and the microbes are pushing them because they are getting warmer and they can decompose longer in the year to be in sources annually than sinks. Even if they become less sinks, that's really important. And if they actually flip become sources, that's like a double-edged sword. Not only are you not cleansing the atmospheric carbon, you're now adding new carbon. From it. And so that's that's really, really bad. Wow. You, are you very diligent about watching how much fish you eat? I am not anymore. But I was just telling a story. I had a niece over um, this weekend, and she's six. And um, we had fish Saturday night. Should have been Friday night. But, yeah. <laughs> Didn't work out. And um, we made her a hot dog. I just didn't want to give her any perch out of the pig in the lake. <laughs> she eats fish, so I'm not saying she doesn't, but yeah. it just seemed like she just about had a hot dog anyway. <laughs> so yeah, be careful of your grandkids and sons and daughters and whatnot, they'll be ages and you know, make sure that they're not overdoing it. I guess it's a good good message at the end here. Yeah. Do most fishermen release these fish as opposed to taking them home and eating them? Absolutely. Catch and release is, when I was a kid, there wasn't a thing called catch and release. You kept everything. You ate everything. That's the way it was. But catch and release has really come off big in the last 30 years or so. And uh, yeah, thankfully, they don't go on the wall. Most of them go back in the lake. Thankfully. And it's more about genetics and making big fish for future generations than mercury. Mercury has nothing to do with why we do that. <laughs> clean coal, we call clean coal. Is that still around as a big part of the thing? Does it make any difference at all? Clean coal, probably, I think I've seen studies where the emissions from the cleaner coal varieties actually do produce less mercury out of the smokestacks, just like it produces less CO2 and methane. Um, but it's still significant. I mean, very significant. And so I don't, yeah, I got to be careful as a federal employee, but the term clean coal is not something I would ever use <laughs> in my lexicon. <laughs> it's a misnomer. Cattle that uh, eat peatland uh, grass or corn that's uh, produced on uh, peatland, is there any effect on the uh, mercury on cattle? Okay, the first part again. You know, if, if cattle uh, graze on peatland, or if their feed is produced on peatland like alfalfa and corn, 
Or they are affected by mercury. I think there is some studies that show that uh, farm animals that have food sources that are relatively high in mercury also have hot, relatively high mercury sources or mercury in their tissue. Um, but it's never at the level where we would consider it a concern. Um, a cow that eats that, probably a little higher level than a cow that doesn't, but it's not anything above any EPA guidelines. How did you decide that you wanted to spend your life studying soil? Yeah, good question. UW Stevens Point is a very um, good school for natural resources. When I started out, I was a jock. I wrestled in college. That wasn't at point that I was at University of Wisconsin. And I, I quit. And I went to work at a factory for a while. And I got a perspective um, in my hometown, factory in my hometown. I got a perspective. I got married and had a child and blah, blah, blah. And we were ready to hang it up and do that our life. And we just said, well, you know, I think one of us should go back to school. And I said, well, you should go back to school. You're, you are always had better grades than me. She's a little bit of a traditionalist. And she said, you know, you, I want to support you first, and then I'll go back. Okay. So I went to school at Stevens Point in Natural Resources, and they have a summer program called Tree Hit. And Tree Haven is a summer, six weeks summer long program where you do all the majors in the, in the program, water, wildlife, soil, and forestry. And all of a sudden, when I got to Tree Haven, I got to the soil section, I excelled like no one else in my class. And I don't know why, I don't know why I took to it so much. And from that point forward, I knew I was gonna be a soil scientist. <laughs> So UW Stevens Point, my wife's main name is Fox. UW Stevens Point now has a Coca Fox scholarship for a soil student of uh, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Non-traditional soil student because my wife and I were not traditional at the time with kid in hand. And if they can't find a non-traditional soil student to give her a thousand dollars to every year. And they'll just pick a student in the soils program to get it. And first and foremost, that there's a student that could use that help because they're raising a family. Whatever. And so that's now paid off and will be in perpetuity. That's how I'm giving you that. Thank you. <laughs> and I also send my to the soils judging team at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> Believe it or not, there is such a thing as soil judging. In the uh, critical provincial park north of the boundary waters, the Canadians not only do not allow live bait for fear of introducing new species of minerals, uh, etc., but they also don't allow barbed hooks. You have to use barbed hooks or you have to file off the barbs on your hooks on your lures. Right. And they don't allow live bait, so you do lose, you do have to use some kind of artificial lures. Do you suspect that there's more survival? Evidently, there's a lot of uh, a lot of loss of fish, especially the water worms from this catch and release, which I think is kind of a farce. Uh, <laughs> that's it, that's there's that's definitely... extreme. Do you suspect there's more survival? Uh, in in the uh, critical because of the barbless hook when people release a big fish that they yeah, yeah I do and it's obviously outside the wheelhouse too but I, I do look at fish studies as you can see I like fishing and the barbless hook idea that the critical and other places in Canada all Canada uses it in Ontario I think at least in all the places I've been to um, the survival rate is generally higher with barbless hooks than barbed hooks. Now, if you catch a muskie like today, with a barbed hook or a non barbed hook, it probably ain't going to make it no matter what you got on a 90 degree day in the you know, middle of August and the end of September, obviously. You know, because of the fight and whatnot, it, it's just too big a fish to be like that. But I think, by and large, I think the barbless hook idea is a good one. By and large. If you don't mind losing a quarter of your fish. 
Yeah. Right, we'll do one last question back here. Randy, you may not want to answer this, or you may want to answer it, or you may want to answer it, don't want to. Uh, but do you think, if you want to answer it, do you think we'll ever get a handle on climate change before it uh, probably won't destroy us as a species, but radically alter the species, the human species and how we live it? Will we ever get a handle on it? Because everything I see, it is either slowly getting worse or radically getting worse. And I just wonder how in the world we'll ever change it. Yeah, it's tired. Hopefully no one's taking those or writing a story on this, but uh, I think the answer is I don't think we're going to in time. I don't think we're going fast. I don't know if we're doing enough. I think it's, you know, I don't want to leave on a low note, but I, I think the climate change Answer right now is pretty weak, unfortunately. Oh, uh, yeah. One of the plants that has excelled at spruce with warming is blueberries. Yeah. And so, if you're a blueberry person and you have a blueberry festival that I've been to, by the way, um, it's going to be a blueberry future for sure. So, there are some good things, I guess. But not planetarily, no. <laughs> we really appreciate learning from you. Thank you for sharing your expertise for us. Thank you, everyone. I was just up here. Thanks, everyone. All right, we'll see you all next week. We're going to learn about the North Country Trails, perhaps with our friend Jeff Pike and some of his friends as well. So stay tuned for who exactly we'll be learning from and what we'll be together next week. <laughs>